Coming up tonight, Malaysia hits a new high of 3,309 COVID-19 cases just hours after a state of emergency was declared. Not a man to mince his words, former PM Mahathir Mohamad criticised his successor's decision, saying an emergency is unnecessary. And what an otter surprise for some office workers when these utterly adorable otters found their way in. This is The Straits Times News Night. I'm Dylan Ang. Good evening, I'm Chow Suen. We begin with news just in that Singapore Airlines staff have been offered COVID-19 vaccinations by the government. And the exercise will begin tomorrow. SIA says the vaccine is available to Singapore-based staff who are currently on a rostered routine testing programme. Those who are eligible include cabin crew, pilots, staff who interact with passengers at the airport and selected engineering personnel. The exercise will take place at the arrival hall of Changi Airport Terminal 4. Participation is voluntary. From ex-premiers to current MPs, Malaysian politicians today wasted no time in criticising Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin for declaring a state of emergency to battle the COVID-19 crisis. Former Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad slammed the decision, saying there was simply no need for an emergency. He told the Star Online, even without an emergency, the government has enough powers to manage the COVID-19 situation. When you tell Malaysians to go into lockdown, they will go into lockdown. He goes on to say the emergency is called because of the increasing spread of COVID-19. But what is it that the government cannot do without declaring an emergency? Meanwhile, UMNO MP Nazri Aziz argues that seeking an emergency was an admission of defeat by the Prime Minister. Mr Aziz was one of two UMNO MPs who withdrew their support from the ruling Perikatan National Coalition shortly after the emergency declaration. More now from the Straits Times Malaysia Bureau Chief Shannon Teo on what this means for the PM. We've had two UMNO MPs so far as of this afternoon, uh, who have decided that they're not going to support the Perikatan National Government anymore. So that leaves uh, Muhyiddin with 109 out of 220 MPs. So he has effectively lost his majority, if, if anyone's still keeping count. But um, he won't have to pass any laws in Parliament. He won't have to uh, uh, you know, face any kind of vote right now because he has the emergency uh, declaration. So um, his government will remain um, unless someone can gain an audience with Agong and tell the Agong, well, I have more than 109 uh, or, or more than 110 and you should uh, make me Prime Minister instead. That's pretty much the only path that uh, any challenger has right now. We'll be watching that very closely after what has been a day of fast-moving developments. When Malaysians woke up this morning, the main thing on their minds was the impending movement control order. Then at 11 o'clock, Prime Minister Mohedin announced on national TV that the country was now in a state of emergency, effective up to August 1st. He stressed that it's not a military coup, no curfew will be enforced and there will not be a general election during this time. To all the stakeholders keenly monitoring what is happening in Malaysia, I emphasise that Malaysia is open for business in facing these challenging times, this period of emergency will give us much needed calm and stability, as well as enable us to focus on economic recovery and regeneration. The situation in Malaysia is serious. Health officials logged a record 3,309 new coronavirus infections today. The biggest daily rise since the pandemic was first detected in the country on January 25th last year. This comes ahead of tougher restrictions on movement to be imposed in several states from midnight tonight. Over here for the fourth straight day, there are no new cases in the community or from workers' dormitories. But 17 new cases were confirmed today, all of whom were imported and had been placed on stay-home notices or isolated upon arrival here. Now over in the US, Congress is heading for a big showdown with President Donald Trump. Democrats in the House of Representatives plan to vote to impeach him on Wednesday, exactly a week after his supporters stormed the Capitol building. It comes as Mr Trump remains defiant before his term expires on January 20th, even though he's unable to vent his frustrations on social media after Facebook, then Twitter and others banned him. 
In the aftermath of the siege, social media giants have swooped in and taken strong enforcement action. Just today, Twitter announced that it has banned more than 70,000 accounts since Friday. These accounts run by pro-Trumpers were primarily dedicated to sharing QAnon content. And it's not just Twitter. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Reddit, YouTube and Twitch have all enforced bans and removed content from Donald Trump and his supporters' accounts. Others have said that the bans are not only welcome, but necessary. However, not everyone agrees. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has hit out at Twitter, saying that it's up to governments and not companies to limit freedom of speech. Here's Facebook's chief operating officer on the firm's decision to remove Trump from the platform. So why did we do it? We have clearly established principles that say you cannot call for violence in this moment. We took down those posts that we thought might be calling for violence or were calling for violence immediately. But in this moment, the risk to our democracy was too big that we felt we had to take the unprecedented step of what is an indefinite ban. And I'm glad we did. Let's take a look at what's been trending on social media and sparking conversations today. If you haven't heard by now, the Sex and the City ladies are back together again, minus one. Sarah Jessica Parker, Cynthia Nixon and Kristen Davis will star in a reboot of the series set to air on HBO Max. Fans of Kim Cattrall, however, will be disappointed that she will not appear in the series. The new 10-episode show titled And Just Like That will follow the three characters as they navigate life and friendship in their 50s, with production scheduled to begin in New York in late spring. Are you a big fan of the series? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Now moving on, at least two gorillas at California's San Diego Zoo have caught the coronavirus, the first known instance of natural transmission to great apes. Two primates are said to have begun coughing last week while a third is showing symptoms. They are believed to have contracted the virus from an asymptomatic zoo worker, though this has yet to be confirmed. So they're doing okay. They're experiencing some mild symptoms and we continue to observe them. Uh, but they're drinking, they're eating and they're interacting with one another. So we'll continue our observations closely with our veterinary team and we'll address each symptom uh, as they arise or if they arise. Very heartbreaking, here's to a speedy recovery for the gorillas. Now what could be a better pick-me-up on a gloomy day than some adorable otters frolicking in your office? This cute wildlife surprise is exactly what some office workers at 9 Penang Road got on Monday. A group of 13 smooth-coated otters were seen trooping through the building towards Fort Canning Park to the delight of their onlookers. Led by one adult, the frolicking family slowly made their way through the 24-hour link to the park. In sports, the 2021 Formula One calendar will kick off in Bahrain at the end of March, instead of the usual Australian Grand Prix. The reshuffling comes as the Australian and Chinese Grand Prix were postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Melbourne race will now take place later this year in November, while the new Shanghai race date has yet to be confirmed. F1 still intends to run a 23-race calendar, with no change to the Singapore race, scheduled to take place on the 3rd of October. Seems like taking just the sporting world by storm is not enough for 23-year-old Naomi Osaka, who has just been named luxury brand Louis Vuitton's latest brand ambassador. Serving up Grand Slams and high fashion, three-time Grand Slam winner, Forbes' highest-paid female athlete and Sports Illustrated's Sports Person of the Year. Osaka's no stranger to success and the limelight in the sporting world. This latest achievement will see the young athlete in the label's Spring-Summer 2021 campaign. Before we go, injections may soon become a thing of the past for diabetics. Scientists at Nanyang Technological University have developed insulin nanoparticles that may one day become the basis for an oral medicine. The team designed a nanoparticle loaded with insulin at the core, then coated with alternating layers of insulin and chitosan, a natural sugar. Through cell cultures and rat models, it demonstrated that this layer-by-layer -layer coated nanoparticle is stable as it passes through the stomach into the small intestine with minimal insulin release. And it is able to pass through the intestinal walls into the bloodstream. 
In a preclinical study, the team fed insulin containing nanoparticles to rats and found that insulin increased in their blood minutes later. Insulin therapy is an important part of treatment for diabetes, a metabolic disease that affects 422 million people globally. With that, we wrap up the Straits Times News Night. Do visit straitstimes.com to see more news and videos. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the button below. Have a great evening and we'll see you tomorrow.